Hi, everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulty. I believe what happened was that our last presenter was co-host so that they could share screen and they may have accidentally ended the meeting for everyone. We are waiting for the rest of our board members to also join the meeting. Again, apologies. Logging back home. All right. Uh, hi. All right, we're back up to 11 participants. Everybody's cool. Um, yeah, so we only have a couple more items left. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, actually reorder some of the items. Uh, where is stuff? Where is it? All right, so is our board back? Yeah. Ooh, nice. I don't think everyone is back yet. Okay, yeah, let's just give it a minute here. My lights have been flickering a lot too uh, at night. I don't know why. Power surge. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to strike item C. Uh, uh, table it for the next meeting. All right. Um, It looks like Maybe. everybody is back. Excellent. All right, is Jacqueline? Um, let's see, I'm bad at the Zoom. Attendees, yeah, Jacqueline's here. Mm -hmm. In just a second. One, one second, did you get it fixed, Fernanda? I did. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. I'll oh, jump on right back when I'm done right now. All right, that's everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Vince is uh, taking care of business, right? So we're gonna continue with the agenda, correct? We have everybody, panel of seven. Uh, uh, Jacqueline, do you need to share your screen? Yes, please. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, Diego, oh, Diego's in the attendee side. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, are there any other um, presenters, Jacqueline, uh, like um, residents or anything on the attendee side? Let's see. Yep. It would just be me for today. Arturo, Diego, Erica, and Tony. Okay. Let me know if you're able to share your screen. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, so we're going to continue with this meeting now. Uh, meeting back on. Um, and we're going to start here with item number, okay, for the record, toot toot, item number uh, 4B, discussion of possible action on letter, letter, regarding natural park at Ramona Gardens housing development, anti-pollution green buffer between Ramona Gardens and the 10 freeway. Uh, conceived by Conservation Solutions CCS with partnership team Legacy LA, we did community engagement, uh, SWA Landscape Architecture, and VS2 Consulting Inc. Engineering. And Land IQ will be doing the plants. I, I, if I got that right. Um, and uh, yeah, so Jacqueline, take it away. Thank you for having me here, and I'll do my best to keep it short, brief. Um, so what you all are gonna be learning about is a potential project that will be um, happening in Ramona Gardens. It's not approved as a planning item. It hasn't been um, in the permitting process yet. So I can get into those details in a little bit, but this is an imagined plan for a natural park that is coming from community members, both youth and adult leaders. And my name is Jacqueline. I lived in Ramona Gardens and Boyle Heights, and I just want to make sure that you all 
feel like you can learn as much as possible. I'm still learning about this park as well because I haven't been in all the dialogues like with SWA and all the, the architects, um, but I will do my best to answer all the questions I can. So here's the main team, it's Legacy LA, Community Conservation Solutions and Felman Consulting. Here's the big team. Um, here's the funding. A lot of funding comes from cap and trade. And CARB gave um, some funds for us to build the capacity of youth leaders and adult leaders. So we've done some low cost air monitoring. We've done some truck counting on the playground right next to the 10 freeway. So some of this has been just a huge learning opportunity for youth. Um, a lot of times air pollution is, has been normalized in our neighborhoods. So we don't really recognize it as a problem until we start talking about all the issues and everyday like allergies and asthma that people have on, on a regular basis. Some of the work that has been completed up to date is community engagement, the content plan. We, I'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem science, uh, air pollution reduction evaluation report, engineering, landscape architecture, and a schematic design. All of this is on our website, it's legacyla.org. So why do we do this? Ramona Gardens and North Boyle Heights is part of the top 1% most polluted communities in California. And some of the pollutants that we have are PM. That's one of the ones that we focus on the most because it comes from everything that combusts fossil fuels. Our air quality is unhealthy 40% of the year. We have on average 218,000 average cars per day traveling on the 10 freeway alone. And the 10 freeway has 15 lanes of daily traffic, bus and carpool lanes and a rail as well. All of this right next to bedrooms, uh, people and kitchens, you know, so it's really damaging to people's everyday lives. Oh, sorry about that. That's the project site in context of the LA River. And the reason it's important is because it's right the project site is right by a storm drain, so that would connect us to the LA River. Mm. So again, some of the cumulative impacts that are coming to our neighborhood is adult obesity, teen obesity, asthma, poverty, and there's 18,000 residents and 700 children in the community. That's 14,000 people per square mile, so it's a little bit crowded. Um, and um, the most sensitive people to air pollution are children and seniors. Is that from Calenviro, Calenviro screen? Correct. Uh, okay, and when you say that area, that's a census tract, I believe it, it, that when you click on it, it's Hillside Village too, right? It's like not just Ramona Gardens. They don't have 18,000 people, correct? Um, it's for the North Boyle Heights area, correct? Yeah, I could, okay, yeah. I was cruising on that map yesterday. Uh, all right, sorry about that. Okay. No worries. So here's the lanes and that's right next to the, the community. And you can see that there's pieces of the neighborhood that don't have an actual wall. It's just a fence. Damn. That's where that secret lane is, right? Where you can like ride real fast. Uh, some people do, yes. <laughs> Here's the natural park site right next to the community. You can see how it's gonna serve as a barrier. Some images of how it looks like. And then here's a context. So the orange circle is a storm drain. The area would be four acres. It has an existing catch basin that's uh, 10, 10 feet pipe underneath the site. So we're gonna be talking about the above ground and below ground, that uh, the impacts that it's gonna cause in the community. So it's the underground. So we're talking about the water, right? Uh, yes. So is this about the storm drains themselves or is this about the older water bodies that were redirected into the sewer? Sorry, I'm asking questions, but there's, there's, there's three existing water on that site, correct? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So 
So here's another part of the problem. The Federal Highway Administration says that 140,000 cars is an average of what a safe health threshold is. The 10 freeway has 218,000 cars on average every day, and the 5 freeway has 234,000 cars on average every day. So we're right by the two of the busiest freeways in the United States. We also have the 710 not too far away, so just a lot of congestion of traffic and truck traffic and industry um, just crossing on them every day. Very quickly, um, we focus on PM because of how tiny it is. Um, that goes into the smallest crevices of your lungs and a lot of illnesses come as a result of it. Allergies and itchy eyes are not normal. It's just normal for some people in the community. Some more illnesses, um, asthma, lung cancer, heart disease, non-fatal heart attacks, premature death and childhood leukemia. So here's what I was talking a little bit about. Because we're looking into native plants, I think my computer froze. Okay. There you go. You can see that we're gonna be working around the deep roots. The deep roots also help with carbon storage and a drought tolerance. So we're talking about climate change now. Uh, there's also a potential for the living organisms, the mycorrhizal fungi, to store some carbon and clean up some of the soil. Um, and then the big trees that will get planted will serve as a year-round layered leaf canopy, and that will also help absorb pollutants, as well as provide natural cooling because, you know, a heat wave is going to come with climate change. We don't currently have a noise barrier in Ramona Gardens. So this would be a huge plus as well as collecting some of the pollutants or blocking it off. Overall, it's to improve the air quality and health, um, quality of healthy life. Something we like to emphasize is that all this comes from dialogues and conversations that we have from community of all different ages, youth and adult leaders. In 2016, they did a study and they said that they needed a better air and green open space in order for them to have less illnesses. This was with Legacy LA. 500 surveys were completed. It was an intergenerational survey. Adults, youth, everybody was, um, well, a group of people was going door to door and they were asking people if a natural park was something that they wanted in the community and what they wanted to see. They also invited them to workshops so that they could give their input of what the priorities for this natural park should be. And here's what came out of it. A quiet place for people to escape the city, buffer from freeway noises, a walking trail, shade and seating areas, and improved area for the swap meet. It's a big part of this. Some of the stakeholders that have been able to give their input are listed on this slide. We would love to also um, get your input because we know that this is gonna be part of your community as well. Kind of like on the cusp of Boyle Heights and Lincoln Heights. Well, it was, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Lincoln Heights and Boyle Heights. Always been kind of one neighborhood there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Cool, thank you. So you, um, I guess I just want to ask a couple questions. Just uh, so uh, you're the uh, uh, outreach coordinator with Ramona Gardens, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm a leadership co program coordinator. Okay, leadership programs coordinator. And then so Ramona Gardens has a, a rack, right? Like that's their governmental governing body. The residents council rack. Yes, uh, but let me clarify. I'm a leadership program coordinator for Legacy LA. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, you grew up in Ramona Gardens. But so the the sort of neighborhood council of Ramona Gardens would be the the, the rack, the RAC under Hat, right? Right, because it's county property, right? It is federal property. Federal. Mm -hmm. Um. 
Okay, so I guess I'll save that for the Q&A. And but... also, also in the cusp of LA County, because Indiana, um, the industrial side of Indiana is already LA County. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, what, the boundary? You still, you still LA? Yeah, unincorporated yeah. starts on oh. Indiana. Oh yeah, it cuts around weird city terrace and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, do we have anybody from M Mamona Gardens on the phone? Uh, besides me, no. Uh, Benny, you grew up there. So we can open it to Q&A now. Um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline, did you want to talk about anything else? Like, what is the ETA on this? Like, when, when would they uh, start? We have no actual timeline because of the fact that we're still um, just in the process of talking to people about this park. Um, I think we're taking it slow so that we make sure that everybody gets to have a say and everybody gets to have an input, um, as well as we're looking for some funding so that we can start permitting process. And that takes time because we want to make sure that community is the one that's meeting with these elected officials. So um, recently we had a group of adult leaders meet with Congressman Jimmy Gomez and kind of just give a background of all of these um, infographics. And that was kind of cool. He has given his verbal support for this project and says that he's, um, he's gonna try his best to get some of the earmark money to go to projects like this. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what we have. And we also have um, the verbal support of Kevin De Leon, a council member. He has mentioned that he really likes the idea of community having a say and that this project would be um, kind of like the opposite of gentrification. Um, it would be a beautification process that is coming from residents themselves. And hopefully that would also come with like a different level of protection of developers and um, tourism, I guess. That's a, so, so the green site will be on the federal property, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we need to work. That's another part of it. Like we need to work with Hakla to make sure that they're on board and they feel like it's not going to impact their plans. All right. Um, thank you. And um, we're going to open it up to, should we go to public comments first? Public, let's switch it up. We'll go to public. If there's anybody from the public who wants to, you know, start discussing this, um, raise your hand or press star nine. No? All right. Hands up. Oh. Any board member comments? I have a comment. Damn, what happened to my picture? Screen just disappeared, but uh, can you hear me? Oh, so Jacqueline. I'm on this, uh, I'm looking on Google Maps here, you know, where the freeway's riding up against um, Ramona Gardens, right? Would you like me to stop sharing screen so that you can share? Oh, uh, I have too much crap on my computer. <laughs> okay, okay, oh, I, I got you. Look. All right, so I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm zooming in, I don't know where I am. But you know, the, the 10 is only so many lanes. What is equally the same size as the 10 is the El Monte busway. Mm -hmm. Okay, and like, there's a bunch of action going on with that now because it's sort of an old antiquated sort of busway, uh, fast track little highway that they use. It's a toll way. Um, and there's new motion on it. Oh, wait, I wanted a metro. Okay, I, you know what? Yeah. Do, do, do you guys look into the El Monte busway like that? that should be closed. It's like riding right up against Ramona Gardens. I mean, it's insane. Um, but also, what was I gonna say? It's, so this project is, was conceived by this one corporation, right? Um, CCCS or whatever. And then so it's a bunch of these sort of CBOs doing it. And then they had the project in their minds or something and then put it on Ramona Gardens or I just, like how much input did the community actually have in this thing? And it's, they're using the water thing just like they did with uh, Downey Park 
the uh, clean water plans and stuff, this, the irrigation stuff to plant the trees, like to make it more complicated, you know, to make it so you have, it has to deal with like Bureau of Engineering and all that stuff. Um, like, is it just about like, like if it's about the air pollution from the 10, it's like, yeah, that, that uh, El Monte busway was put in, you know, after Ramona Gardens was put in and that, you know, and now it's not really, uh, it's, it's antiquated and they should really think about that as the source of pollution. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, whatever. But the site, there are a couple different sites for the project that have a lot of different information. Um, like, uh, yeah, like the engineering stuff and then also like the outreach stuff and um, the costs. And I just want to know, like, like, like William Mead's getting kicked out and like that's Hakwa and like Jordan Downs and like that, that hackwa has been having meetings with William Mead and like, you know, they're telling, saying they're going to offer them vouchers or whatever to move. And like that happened at Rose Hills, they tore that down. So it's like, when I read one of these reports, when I read the, it, it was talking about the LA River plan and the cast and connecting it with, you know, some sort of funding with the LA River stuff. It's like, they wouldn't put this like expensive park project in Ramona Gardens just to kick everybody out of Ramona Gardens in a couple of years, would they? I don't think so. Um, and that's all I have to say. Uh, it seems, uh, yeah, you have to read all the reports, I guess. No, I hear you. Um, that's definitely a, a constant fear that happens um, for residents of public housing, where mm -hmm. um, at some point, because you know that it's a public property, it's federal property, you don't really own your home. Um, at any point, like, you know, especially if you know about like, eminent domain and things like that like um that's definitely a stressor but what where i'm coming from with this and why i feel like it could possibly be more of a beautification without gentrification because the community is really activated from seeing projects like this being possible i was part of a small group of youth that was able to get the attention of um aqmd their quality management district and got like the grant for air, air filtration systems in merchantson elementary and this sparked some careers for some people my age like i know a couple of folks went off and became park rangers so i think there is a, a definite sense of ownership of people from ramona gardens over this project and over some other like um campaigns that have been happening in the area around like gentrification and substance use disorder that um, Legacy LA leads. But I do hear what you're saying. And at the end of the day, I feel like I don't really have the answer for that now because of the fact that we haven't been working closely with HACLA. Um, again, like now that the schematic design and all of this has been designed, mm -hmm. now we're doing the presentations and now we're saying like this can be a possibility and we would want to make sure that as many people know about this and understand that it is kind of coming from community so that they don't feel like, oh, well, maybe um, it's a threat, you know, but I do hear you like at the end of the day, like, it's scary, especially when I just sat through this whole USC presentation and, you know, like, it's, it's, it is a, a fear. Well, it's like, it's like when you're, they're not addressing the elephant in the room, you know, it's yeah. like, Hazard Park. You know what I mean? It's, uh, but also the elephant in the room is this. It's like, uh, when I was getting involved in the councils and stuff, you know, I'm looking at the maps and I would, I was like, hey, why is Ramona Gardens gray? Why mm -hmm. is Mead gray? It's not part of CD1 or CD14. What's going on? And I was like, this is pretty messed up. And then uh, now I know, like from doing my little digging around, the city, you know, William Mead is part of the Chinatown Council. I think they kind of, the municipal government let them be part of the city of LA or something, but Ramona Gardens, still on the map, it's not part of Boyle Heights or Lincoln Heights. And uh, basically you have a, a huge population of like, 50, how many, like 1500 people or whatever, uh, no agency, no political agency, no uh, platform. And uh, that's kind of the big elephant in the room. 
Um, but uh, I would love to see this present, you know, see what the people of Ramona Gardens have to say. Um, we have uh, Benny Moreira's hand up. Benny. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I grew up in, in this community and um, I know that the, the projects are about 80 years old. And um, just looking back and I'm like, man, I wish, you know, this park would have been around when I was there. I mean, I just see so many um, <clears throat> benefits from it. And I, I do know from experience how bad, you know, that pollution from the freeway um, can be. So, uh, yeah, I just think it was a really good idea. And um, I think the community is going to benefit greatly from it. I, I'm just, uh, so thank you for bringing it to us, Jacqueline. I, um, I'm just wondering, like, how much of this is a done deal? Like, is it 50%, 25%? And, like, where is the funding? Has the funding say, been secured um, already? No, I would say we're still at 0%. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, like, none of this is a done deal. Everything is kind of just, like, up in the air. Um, again, like, everybody that we've shared it with, shows interest and shares that like this would be amazing to have because like you say like the project has been around for a really long time and it's been kind of just like on the side uh, maybe like neglected a little a lot um those freeways and, weren't there excuse me those freeways weren't there when the when the projects were built right the 10 the yeah. projects were built like in the 40s yeah, well, yeah, right. uh, you know, and the five was built in the fifties, and the ten was built, I think, in the fifties too. Mm -hmm. And so, just imagine, you know, our neighborhoods weren't divided like they are now too. Um, it's pretty incredible the effect, but um, you know. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think we sh we need to support this. I mean, I don't see that. To me, this is like a slam dunk, and um, I'm just shocked that um. Um, saddened that it's only at zero percent. Well, it's, it's uh, as far as it not becoming a, a reality. It's 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 a corporate. It's a it's like a CBO, like it's an organization doing this. Um, so they're at the wheel, uh, and they probably do have uh, access to those people who could fund it. But my concern is this: they've got all these new um, federal. Uh, but equity laws with housing and the feds, FHA, all that stuff. And it's like, when I was over at William Mead and they were having the meeting with Hakla, the guy from Hakla, the representatives they sent from Hakla get paid $500,000. And, you know, we found out, um, it's pretty crazy, but uh, with equity and health and um, this new uh, law, uh, it seems that the federal government um, should be required to uh, provide amenities such as green trees and a park uh, to Ramona Gardens to offset the pollution, right? Like, well, you guys don't even have a park in there, right? You we do have, um, we have what used to be called Henry Alvarez Park. Recently, I saw it as Cruzado Park, um, mm -hmm. but the community knows it as La Loma. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a small piece of grass. Uh, now there's a improved basketball court. The playground is still the same, but Legacy LA is, is working with different nonprofits to find funding to fix the playground as well. Uh, we're also partnering with um, Northeast Trees to put in an ADA ramp. So prior to community mm -hmm. involvement and, and the nonprofits that I just listed out is involvement, like there hasn't been investment in this park since the very beginning. To this day, like there are no trash cans. There's no restroom there. Um, it gets cleaned every so often and oftentimes due to community cleanups that get set up by these nonprofits. Um, I, Hakla has been involved in some community cleanups, um, but uh, I guess I can't say too much of how often they are involved. 
guess there's a lack of checks and balances with the federal government because you know they're um, they have a responsibility, right? But they're also funded. Uh, they have a lot of money too. But um, yeah, but it would, I think it would be super nice if the federal government would just like hand this to community because it's needed. It's crucial yeah. for everybody's well-being. But we've yeah. seen that it takes community activity and people recognizing their right to clean and healthy air to start some kind of movement you know it's like um, they set up the structure basically like with us right with neighborhood councils right we have to we're advisors to the city of la so we're not really supposed to um communicate with people above the city of la right mm -hmm. you're at the federal level but you're going down to like the city level to like get amenities and stuff and get your trash cleaned up um there's something with uh, the federal government that's just, uh, yeah, it's like maybe there's no, a lack of like, they don't have to be held accountable because uh, the people who live in William Mead, uh, you know, aren't rich people. Uh, and it's kind of like isolation, there's just isolation. Like uh, you might have advocates coming through and activists and stuff, but in, in the end they go home, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's that there's a huge issue here and it's about inequity and um, further disenfranchisement to go and, and they just made laws about this and they need to be, they need to do something here because uh, first of all, yeah, it's just messed up. And I see we're all, we're talking a little bit about like the Chipotle and um, just thinking right now around the built environment. Um, Ramona Gardens for a long time wasn't even able to order pizza. So like Domino's and Pizza Hut wouldn't really go into the neighborhood. And now we have a different kind of demographic coming into the area. And now a Chipotle wants to open up. Now the demographic is okay, you know? So yeah, I mean, it has definitely been interesting today. You know, it's like the other elephant, mm -hmm. you know, like we're not supposed to talk about like, you know, who has the money, but it's like USC, you know, and the way the land has moved around over there uh, from county, from uh, LUSD County. And then, you know, oh, all of a sudden this new thing is on city land. Oh, all right. Um, well, and then you're on federal land. So there's all this weird land, right? Hazard Park is city property. Well, certain parts of it, but it's like, just like, man, it broke my heart. Like, you know, or I went up zonal and I was like, hey, I'm gonna check out what they just built over here. You know, so it was like a couple of years, last year. And I went past Hazard Park at uh, Norfolk Street or, Street or whatever. And uh, yeah, they built that like weird wall and just like, it's just like right up against the park. And I look at the old maps of all the houses right over there, like the whole neighborhood, all these houses, hundreds of houses. And uh, so last week I went back on trying to look over at our area four to see how many residents we have near General Hospital. And there's just a couple little houses on Playground Street you know, left. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are your neighbors, like the last ones that you have left over there. It's just like, who's gonna advocate for you when basically all the neighbors are gone because they got displaced by a certain entity. It's yeah. like, you, you guys, yeah, I, I feel like it's like a trick they do a gentrification, divide and conquer. It's like William Mead, it's like, they just go up and start building um, uh, market rate condos right across the street. You know, they don't even talk about it. Yeah, and something that, that has recently started happening, I don't think this has, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but something that I've noticed recently happening with the organizing in Ramona Gardens is in order to build power, we do need to build connection with people who aren't necessarily living in public housing. So making sure that they recognize themselves as neighbors and if something bad happens for people in the projects regarding housing, then that's gonna affect people living in the outskirts and vice versa. So when we bring resources in, we're working on bringing resources for both public housing as Legacy LA. Uh, we're bringing in resources to both public housing and the outskirts because the community isn't just uh, Ramona Gardens public housing. We're recognizing Ramona Gardens as everything. Um, yeah. So then now like, I guess that's why here, like I'm here as well, like uh, to talk to like folks who are from Lincoln Heights because Lincoln Heights is literally just like 
up the street and we're all getting impacted by the same kind of air pollution. We're all getting impacted by the same kind of developments that are coming in and we're not really getting a say in it. Um, a vision. It's like, so making sure that, like we build collective knowledge and we build community power so that we can continue to see the neighborhood that we want to see rather than just kind of like get left with the bits and pieces that they, they leave for us. Yeah. I mean, uh, you see guys got a link in high school, right? You got, you got a Lincoln, right? Ramona Gardens? Uh, it's Lincoln, Wilson. Um, I, I actually went to a charter. Oh, is it? Because I mean, like, like yeah, historically, I, historically, it's, it has been Lincoln. Yeah. But, but you, yeah, so I believe most of it is still Lincoln. So Do you feel based, like based stigmatized, on what I know. stigmatized, like the PJ, like projects? Like, uh, cause I mean, like, I don't see the difference between William Mead and like, yeah, or like I live, like all my neighbors are section eight or vets and you know, or when you live in a place long enough, the rent's like, or whatever, you know what I mean? You get assistance and all that stuff. And it's like, everybody's kind of equally, whatever, just enfranchised to a certain extent, but you contribute to Lincoln Heights. You're part of Lincoln Heights, you shop in Lincoln Heights, you're a stakeholder. It's like, yeah. Uh, we want to be act, or I want to be active in in the gardens and whatever, um, helping advocate for what you guys want. And well, um, for sure, if you all have any additional questions, or if you all would want me to come back and present, um, I can go ahead and do that. You all have my email, um, Jacqueline at legacyla.org. Um, you can go ahead and contact me with any questions, or if you want to get involved, you can also ask like what you can do. Yeah, and we're gonna um, vote right now on a letter. Um, yeah, I believe, oh, Madam yeah. President, I believe Fernanda had her hand up. Oh, Bernie, sorry, I can't see my little video. Yeah, thanks, Benny. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, this kind of stuff is really conflicting because our communities truly do need more green space. We need more trees. Um, we are like the most air polluted communities and that's a form of environmental racism. Um, but I think that it's uh, reasonable for the community to be wary of these kinds of projects mm -hmm. because if we take Chinatown, for example, the park yeah. that they have there is used as an asset for gentrification and really isn't even an accessible park. You have to pay $20 for parking. Um, you know, it's not really for the community, it's more for the luxury condos across the street. So I think, you know, in order to really look at these projects, you know, I would need a lot more information. And I understand this is at the very inception of this project, it's at zero percent. But I think things that we need to look at is who's funding this? Um, what are the city organizations that are putting their money behind this? Who are the politicians putting their money behind this? Um, because there is a pattern and there is a trail to a lot of the stuff that has happened in Los Angeles. Um, but that does not mean that our communities do not need to be, you know, um, invested in so that we have a healthy, safe environment. Um, I think that, you know, how you mentioned, it's definitely the community that needs to be in control of that and navigating these projects and making the decisions behind these projects. Um, so I, the idea behind this project, I mean, I'm totally for it. I just think that I would need a lot more details once it comes down to funding and who's supporting this project in order to be able to make a better assessment as to how this will fit in with our communities. Yeah, and I think KDL being on the meeting or with the uh, East Side, Adelanta East Side Redevelopment Plan, the USC, uh, Mega, mega mega plan, USC, uh, whatever, specific plan. This plugs into that. Um, with a lot of this, these city moves with their specific plans, like the CASP and the East Side Redevelopment Plan, they rely on a lot of nonprofits that they put money into. They put money into to absolve them of what they're, they're doing or to make it look better or whatever. Um, bread and circuses sometimes, but uh, it's this. It's like, we've got a lot of nonprofits or, you know, CBOs, Boyle Heights, some in Lincoln Heights or whatever. Um, but uh, how many of the nonprofits or charitable orgs uh, 
hire, okay, so they might hire local, but how many have people from Lincoln Heights on the board? Not many, you know what I mean? Like that's real representation, not just, you know, you know, whatever, doing the, the, low, the low level job, but yeah, it's like, uh, there's a lot of money, but who's handling the money? And that's the issue. You have yeah. another board member, uh, Melanie? No. I'm gonna make it really quick. Um, yeah, like Fernie said, it's like, oh, this is so, it's so difficult to know the right thing to do. Um, I will say, Jacqueline, you being here makes a huge difference, um, like as an actual community member and someone directly affected by this. Um, so thank you for being here and taking the time to, to speak with us. Yeah, we, you know, uh, there's a, a motion. I don't know if I should. Yeah, let's do a motion. Yeah, we can do a motion. I also want to also, I want to add something to the motion because there's no really, the actionable item is a letter, right? It'll be a letter of support for the project, this project. But what we should do is that Ramona Gardens needs representation, you know, historically part, you know, Hazard Parks in Lincoln Heights or they're part of Lincoln Heights. Uh, can we do a, um, it, 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 do they want to be part of a neighborhood council? Do they, you know, do they want to be part of, do they want a seat on Lincoln Heights or Boyle Heights or like, how can we um, give, share our platform with them because they're part of our community? And that's, you know, an equitable move uh, for discussion, you know, um, but like, uh, yeah, a bigger picture kind of thing. Like Benny grew up there. Benny wanted to do outreach there, right? Like, can we do a sort of working group or something or start a new committee? Before we set the motion, there is a hand up in public comments. Yeah. Jabs, you may now unmute yourself. Jabs. Hi. Hi, how are you, everybody? Yo, yo. Um, <clears throat> just uh, um, I have a quick comment and, and question also. So this Legacy LA, what is the experience uh, uh, of you guys in regards of uh, creating parks and um, and uh, serving to uh, 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 communities in when the majority are where the majority are are Latinos, and also um, quick comment. It's like, we need to be very careful with all, with all this uh, green. I agree with, with Fernanda that we need more green areas, uh, 100%. Uh, however, uh, we have to be very careful because most of these green amenities are part of the green gentrification that it's coming along with the development. And unfortunately, unfortunately most of these uh, beautiful parks uh, are sitting on, on contaminated uh, uh, areas and will serve eventually to the newcomers because as we all notice, most of the uh, uh, long-term residents in our communities are being uh, displaced. So yeah, we're gonna enjoy it for a couple of years, but after that, we're gonna have to move to, to the desert or somewhere else. And then the parts will be enjoyed by the newcomers, people with more, more affluent and more um, uh, wealthy. Uh, so my question is that, what is that, what is the, uh, um, uh, how do you call that, experience with creating and designing and maintaining uh, public parks? Thank you. Can I answer that? Yeah, Jacqueline. Oh, uh, so Legacy LA has zero experience designing parks. Um, it's a youth development organization, so it's morally emphasizing on like building leadership, um, creating spaces where people can have um, safe dialogues around what's happening in the community. Um, so kind of more like on organizing and building community power. Um, some of the stuff that we're really pushing for with this park is, because um, we don't see it as just a park, it's a way to improve people's lives. Um, we wanna make sure that it comes with public art. So these, opportunities would be able to provide some job training and workforce development for people that are interested in, in art, the native habitat planting, also providing space for people to learn about native habitats, 
and um, potentially going to those kinds of careers. Employment during construction, we want to make sure that it is local hire. Um, ongoing maintenance um, of the habitat, that's also included into the, the funding that we're asking for the park because we do notice that like a lot of our parks, they're created, but then no further investment is gone into this parks. So they're kind of just like run down or a lot of the negative consequences that come with neglected spaces. Um, there's also La Plaza Verde, and I didn't get a chance to walk through that, but that's a, we call it Lagachon. I don't know if you all have ever been there, but there's like, prior to COVID, there was a lot more activity there. It was like, Every Saturday they would get together, there was food, music, and different vendors would sell um, like affordable products like soap, plates, um, anything that community needed, they could find there on Saturdays for a very affordable cost. And what they, oh, where's the image? What this park is doing, what Legacy LA is doing is making sure that this is a big emphasis of it. So creating a space for the swap meet to continue to happen because if you all know um, recently it was considered a legal swap meet now and this was by community members also fighting for that Have so everything down. everything that the community um, is asking for to remain we want to make sure that it does for example there was this mural here it is a mural that that people in the community were really scared that it was going to get removed so right now it's on the six foot wall and we are asking to increase the height to a 14 foot wall that's going to require for the wall to come down and it's going to have to get rebuilt oh. what we need to do is make sure that whoever gives us the funding understands that some of that funding has to go to the reproduction of the existing mural because that's what community is asking for does that make sense so what legacy la is is more like making sure that the community priorities are being prioritized as these other CBOs are coming in and working on developing the park. You know, Jacqueline, I'm gonna tell you something straight up. I've been going through my files here on that Hyatt, right? Which mm -hmm. is what the Chipotle is part of. I'll just make it quick. So, you know, whenever there's a hearing, the public can write letters in and then what you know, uh, some of the applicants do is they get a lobbyist to go around and do due diligence around the neighborhood and give out a, a, a canned letter to all the community orgs to sign this letter, right? So there were three letters supporting the Hyatt Hotel. The same letter, it was uh, the, the YMCA, oh no, four, the Y at, at, the, at the hospital, right? Um, Plaza de la Raza, um, uh, Boys and Girls Club of Ramona Gardens, and then El Arca. And it said this, the East Side has a lack of high-end restaurants and places for families to go out for a nice dinner. Um, we deserve uh, fancy things and shouldn't have to go spend our money in other communities. Um, Plaza de la Raza runs, you know, they have the mural, the art programs run by uh, muralists, uh, Romero or whatever, you know, like the resources are right there, but it's that the jurisdiction of all of these things, like it doesn't cross over. Like, I don't know why there's a disconnect, but it's the biggest thing that's a problem in our community is that each entity is, it operates like it's its own universe, mm -hmm. um, like Parks and Rec or whatever. It's like that, it's so bad that we can't even access the public land, you know? And uh, I guess there needs to be more like, people need to be held accountable or whatever. Uh, you know, they should, like Plaza de la Raza should be active over Romana Gardens checking out that mural or whatever. I don't know why they're not. Um, and if I could add that, that's also part of what this is like, we, we, or at least like you're making me think like people shouldn't have to go to another neighborhood to look for clean air. And that's a basic necessity. People shouldn't have to have to drive like to Griffith Park and have to pay for parking or even to downtown LA to Vista Hermosa for a natural habitat. Yeah, it's your 
you're right, you're right. But, you know, Hazard Park, Ascot Hills, Elephant Hill, or Paradise Hill, and uh, well, at Flat Top, it's all part of the same mountain range. You guys are on it, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know? It's that when the city makes maps or whatever maps, it, the space, your spatial relationship with your community changes. Like, if you just look at that whole little mountain range right there, we are all, we are connected to you. Like, yeah. um, but they divide, right? They divide us. Uh, whatever we fight for at Flat Top, land justice stuff, that applies to you, you know? It's one community. Uh, and uh, yeah, Diego, uh, yeah, he's working doing the different hills and stuff, but that has to be taken up as like the, a big issue, right? And I think, uh, Jimmy Gomez is kind of on that. So that's, he's a good guy to have in, in your court because he's at the federal level. Yeah. Um, Are there any more board member comments? So you, you guys just keep connected with us and uh, yeah. we'll invite you back for, you know, yeah, we, we want more dialogue. All right, so let's uh, make a motion um, to approve a letter, maybe, with a motion. Okay, so I present the motion to approve the letter regarding natural park at Ramona Gardens housing development. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll second. Thank you, Benny. Um, before voting, I'll move it to public comment one last time. If anyone from the public wishes to say something, please raise your hand or press star nine. We have um, Erica P. Hello, I just had a few more questions about the organization behind this proposal. Can I just get more info on like, again, how do you plan on um, using the space for your youth programs? What youth programs you currently have going on? Do you already, do you have a currently like a garden program for the youth? as well currently going um and just like more details about that thank you yeah so we do have a youth council program it has three different cohorts so um, they level up first year second year for um, once they complete second year they can intern and um, all of these are incentivize uh, financially for them so that they can start building their their awareness of what kind of work they can do after high school. So these are high school students, uh, ninth through 12th grade, and the concepts that they're learning about are social justice, environmental justice, substance use disorder, and gentrification and displacement. And I don't have a garden program for them, but I've started building around different resources so that the youth can have access to like outings. Um, we're gonna be visiting Ascot Hills very soon. And um, I think you're talking about the same Diego, but I may be wrong. Um, he's gonna be doing some presentation and activity around native plants, as well as the youth are gonna be able to learn about the organizing that it took to get Ascot Hill to be what it is today. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. I feel like every day um, I'm learning and connecting to more organizations. Um, I think Axis is also a big part of that. So um, some days we're able to use a van and transport people to different areas of the community. And some days we don't have access to that. So um, that's, that's another part of our reality. I hope that answers your questions. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and move this to vote. Do you see jobs here? I think it might have been up from last time. Jabs, do you have any comment? No, no, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to, to uh, lower my hand. Sorry about that. No worries. Great. So now we're moving on to a vote. Again, the motion is to approve the letter regarding the natural park at Ramona Gardens housing development. Sarah from Denning? Uh, yes. Letters. 
Uh, Vincent Chente. Benny Madera. Uh, yeah, but just to be clear, it's a letter of support, right? That's right. Okay, so yes. Support based off of the desires of the residents of, of uh, Ramona Gardens. So it's what they want we're going to champion. Okay, Matt, yes. Got it. Yes, for Benny, Melanie. Yes. Christopher Adams. Yes. Nancy. Nancy Soto. Back to you, Richard Ortiz. Simon. Oh, Richard. Vincente Montalvo. Oh. Motion carries. Nancy Soto, one more time. Hi, sorry. Uh, yes. All right, so motion carries. Ooh. Bravo. Uh, my gavel, tap, tap. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Jacqueline, yeah. So I'll be in touch with you and yeah, we'll work together. I like that. And um, I just want to note that I'm, I'm super on board for your letter to say something like that, like that you support so long as the project meets community priorities over the priorities of the nonprofits leading it. Yeah. We want that would be perfect. Yeah, we want people behind the wheel, right? That's the point of uh, democracy, I guess. Right? Um, we really appreciate your time and efforts, Jacqueline. Thank you. Dude, thank you for presenting today. You thank you app. so much. Um, and then, do you know what time the meeting tomorrow will be? Oh, yeah, that's at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. 6 o'clock, OK. I just need the agenda for that, too. Uh, OK. Yeah. So we're going to uh, vote again as a board to approve it. So uh, tomorrow, if you want to, if you could get some, uh, want to bring some residents to speak, or we can try to hit some people up that we know, uh, just to get a, you know, uh, you, you will present again to the board tomorrow. Yeah. You have the, okay. the, yeah, if you Thank want. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really happy. Thank you. Great. All right. No, okay. And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Totally. Cool. All right, so now we're gonna move on to item. So we're gonna skip the uh, general hospital one or table it for the next meeting because uh, it's kind of a big one. Um, so we're gonna move on to item, well, the, 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 the filming one, right? Discussion and possible action on letter to city attorney, LA mayor, film LA, CD14, LA housing department, HCID regarding cro chronic commercial filming affecting rent stabilized RSO tenants living above mixed use commercial storefronts in Lincoln Heights, loss of tenants right to quiet enjoyment, Cal California Civil Code 1927. It's a nuisance to working class POC, 99th percentile of environmentally burdened communities, Cal EnviroScreen, just like Jacqueline was showing uh, this data, right? In the highest echelon. Um, so uh, we have a presenter and a letter and a story to tell, and um, that's it. So, uh, we'll move. Uh, yeah, so the discussion. And before we get to the CIS, we do have an LA film rep, Arturo Pina. Um, if you want to discuss a bit about how our community can go about reaching out to you guys to enforce um, when production companies are violating our communities, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like in Lincoln Heights. Hi, good evening, everyone. I wasn't sure if I needed to raise my hand or, or not, but thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Uh, just right off the bat, I'm a little confused by the motion. Uh, so I'm glad I'm here. I'm hoping I can clarify a few things uh, and I'm hoping I can help the neighborhood council out uh, because there's a lot in this motion and the reality is when it comes to filming is, and Fernanda also had the opportunity to speak with Sergeant Aguirre earlier today who oversees the LAPD film unit. I say that because there are resources that exist when it comes to the film permit process to address issues such as chronic filming, frequent filming, residents being impacted, so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, my team, which I lead the outreach and education team 
we are consistently out in the community working with neighborhood councils, neighborhood associations, highlighting what that process is. Uh, no one should ever feel that they are at the whim of a production company or a production company that says they, they have a permit and they can do whatever they want. That's definitely not the case. So I wanted to be sure to uh, not just present, but highlight that we're 24 seven, wherever these issues are occurring, we can address them surgically. And what I mean by that is address by address. The way this, the way I'm reading this motion is it's a, a blanket motion and getting, getting support from some of those agencies such as the city attorney, CD14, all these departments who we work with. Uh, I, I would say they'll, they'll come and question, okay, Arturo, are you aware of what's going on over here? And I'll say, no. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to have this conversation because perhaps we can move in the direction of where these com concerns are coming from. And then what we can do, which we've done for 20, 25 years, is we can begin going to the heart of where the issue lies and then mitigate those issues and then ensure that productions are properly coordinating and communicating with those that are having their quality of life impacted. It's a long-winded opening speech, but I appreciate you giving me the time. Thank you, Arturo. Um, I do appreciate you being here. Um, but I do have to say that it is a bit um, regrettable that you're not aware of what is happening in Lincoln Heights, simply because we had a very uh, recent incident um, last Friday where several community members called in to LA Film and there wasn't really any follow-up. Um, LA Film confirmed that the permits were being violated but nothing was ever really done. I was told that um, I would get a follow-up from the outreach committee team, which I believe you stated that you um, run that, um, and I haven't received anything. Uh, the community members that called that night, half of them got the answers, uh, their phone calls answered. The other half, it just no one ever heard back. Um, and it's uh, really frustrating when specifically our streets here are being used for filming all the time. And with the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council, we do get a lot of inquiries of stakeholders and residents asking, what can we do about this? This is not okay. And it's also important to consider that our community is mostly working class. Um, most don't speak English. So reporting these kinds of instances also is not accessible. Um, and I also think about the way we are treated as a community and how we're compensated for these inconveniences versus other communities like WeHo or West Hollywood. Um, for example, uh, that hit TV show on Fox TV, Shameless, a few years back, that was filmed mostly every day for years, just a couple of blocks down from where I live. That show was filmed in Lincoln Heights and that entire block of uh, residential houses was blocked off for hours every single day for years. And I doubt that any of the people living there ever got compensated. And it's more about the loopholes and the lack of accountability in terms of when I was able to contact, for example, LA Film and how to truly hold production count, um, companies accountable. I question, you know, is there any way we can get compensated for our inconvenience? And the answer that I received was that's a private agreement between production crews and residents living there. We can't truly enforce that, which is a shame because we know that residents like for again in West LA do get compensated for these kinds of inconveniences. In fact, sometimes they get completely relocated and paid for their hotel at the production company's expense. No one ever approaches our community members here when that happens. Um, in fact, we're harassed for being angry at the fact that permits are being violated. We can't access our homes. Um, I'm more than happy to share my screen right now to show pictures, for example, um, this very last recent incident that happened, the entrance to the building uh, where residents lived upstairs was obstructed by plexiglass. So we couldn't even enter our homes if we wanted to. And it's that kind of um, attitude that we face daily whenever this is happening. 
And um, it's really difficult to continue to follow up with these agencies and systems in place when they don't really follow through with following up or hear our concerns seriously. Um, this is them obstructing the entire sidewalk, which is also an ADA violation. Um, nobody can access the sidewalk. Um, equipment uh, Fernanda, I want to I want to go ahead and jump in because I do want to be sensitive to everyone's time and just for a little background too. Uh, I have before coming to FMLA eight years ago. I spent fourteen years with the city of Los Angeles working with the Human Relations Commission and also working with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. So I say that because I understand you're all volunteering your time. Uh, you're bringing up some very specific detailed issues, which I want to dialogue with you, uh, but, I, but I'm not sure if this is the appropriate venue to do that. Uh, being that we're going on also it's three, three hours in, in this meeting, uh, because there, there are some assumptions that are being made. And I'm not, I don't want to come across as being defensive of the, the production companies. What I do want to highlight, though, is that the permit is very clear on what it allows. But however, when, when comments such as their ADA violations or productions aren't being held accountable, uh, I, I have to say that that's just not true. And that's why it's important that we plan accordingly because we need to have LAPD at this conversation. LAPD Film Unit is the enforcement entity, and they will tell you, they cited a couple productions today, as a matter of fact, they shut down productions every day. There is no uh, red carpet for any of these productions. When, when situations such as these are brought to our attention, there may be occasions such as what occurred on Friday, where there were no resources that existed, uh, but when we get back to it, as we're doing right now, we can definitely work to ensure that folks are properly informed about what that process is, including ensuring that productions are bilingual. There's also filming, is, filming is in the DNA of this region. I say that because productions know that the crews on hand, that they've got to have some bilingual temp team members. And if, if they don't, again, and I'm not saying they're perfect because we know they're not. I, I, again, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to tell you here that 130 permits every day are perfect, but the percentages relative to how many are violating are very low. That's because we have the, the resources to, excuse me, to address these things. So, so again, being that it's going on 830 and we were informed about this meeting at five o'clock this afternoon, it would be great if we could either move this to another committee meeting, because I see you have quite a few committees, including the outreach uh, committee, which I believe would be a perfect venue also for a discussion such as this. Uh, and even maybe even the community events committee. Those are just my suggestions. Sure, just, I'm the pre president of the council. I just have like a quick question. Okay, so like citizens have to bear the burden of pr uh, proof, right? But also, uh, you're, uh, Film LA is a nonprofit. Mayor Garcetti did this initiative to boost the film industry by loosening the rules. Uh, these are public assets. These are taxpayer things, the sidewalk, there are things. They don't belong to uh, a nonprofit. They don't belong to corporations who film. These are our streets, right? That's the way a democracy works. We pay for this stuff. And uh, okay, so the police are the monitors of the uh, public private partnership the city has with Film LA or whatever to police it. City has ordinances about uh, violations, right? And there are rules for filming, every little entity does. But we also have federal rules too about uh, civil rights violations and stuff. And, uh, and then we also have house, federal housing rights too, uh, quiet enjoyment of your rental property. So one of the big issues with the chronic filming is when people, and I, I've read tons of articles about this, especially in Encino, in people renting homes almost as sound stages as permanent filming sites. This is a impoverished community. You know, th th what's happening here in Lincoln Heights, the guy called the cops, that's nothing new. Like that's, that's how it goes here. Yeah, this isn't just about an isolated incident, even though that is what's being used. Yeah, and, and again, I'm sorry, I keep jumping in. Yeah, but again, quite, 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 quite a few, but with quite a few assumptions and general, generalizations are being made because I myself am an, an Angelino. I'm from Highland Park. I know exactly, my family's from Wilmington. 
So again, there continues to be this assumption that there's a mistreatment or discriminatory tactics relative to how Encino is treated in comparison to Boyle Heights. And that's why, again, it's important that LAPD filming it is here because they will tell you that the things that you're re referencing, Ms. Clendon, I apologize for not pronouncing your last name appropriately. Putting it towards yourself, this is not about you. You're represented for- Oh, I don't, again, I'm not taking it that way. I, I wanna clarify that, that these processes are across the board. But it's this, it's like, you should be able to talk objectively about the rights of people and law and corporate entities, and, you know, uh, jurisdiction and stuff like that and police. But uh, if we're not talking about like, you're at fault for this. Okay, that's not it. Oh, I'm not, I'm not questioning that. What, what I'm doing is I'm highlighting because, because I'm hearing things that are run differently in comparison to Encino or, or Boyle Heights or, or Lincoln Heights or Chinatown. And that's not the case because again, I provide oversight for all the jurisdictions that we serve. So I know what goes on in San Pedro or what's going on in Silmar or in Sun Valley. And everything that you're showing here, again, we would need to dig into the details of that permit to see if they had the permit, the permission to block the sidewalk the way the way the way it looks there. Arturo, what I'd like to highlight is that we are also bringing forth the commentary from our neighborhood um, stakeholders and residents that constantly email us and message us about the filming that's happening. And we live in Lincoln Heights and we see people violating their permits all of the time. Um, and the answers that we get from you guys in LAPD is that you're short staffed. So it doesn't sound like it's Ooh, possible yeah. for you to I hope you're not getting that um, message. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I would like to finish my statement, please. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like the case that you guys really are regulating everything that is happening. And it is absurd to say that it would be impossible for people not to violate their permits. And it's almost a gaslighting sort of uh, commentary to say that what we're stating as a community, that we are constantly being um, exploited for using our streets as filming without ever being compensated, um, while permits are constantly being violated and saying that that's not the case, that you guys are just making it up and using blanket statements is also not an okay statement to make. Oh my gosh, I have to jump in, Ms. Sanchez. You're, you're drawing conclusions based on, on, on what I haven't even said. I haven't said that. And I apologize if now I am being defensive because now you're making judgments and you're drawing conclusions on nothing I said. No, what, I'm clear. what I'm clarifying is, number one, I do want to apologize if you have been told by our staffers that we're understaffed and we're under-resourced. You may recall, as soon as I heard about this meeting, I gave you a call and I immediately sent you my contact information. So from this point forward, please email me, call me. You can forward that information to any of the board members here. And same thing with the individuals that are contacting you. And that's my point with the resources that exist. If anyone is contacting you about issues relative to filming, please neighborhood council board members, don't feel that you are responsible for addressing it and dealing with it. That's exactly why we are put in this position because we can definitely address those concerns that are coming in, but we've got to address them as they're coming in and we will get out there and we will investigate and we'll double check the permit. Apologize for, for jumping in and interrupting, but again, I'm sure you all would do the same thing when conclusions are being made based on something I did not say. The difference is, okay, so this is all interagency drama, right? Like Film LA is part of the city of LA. You work with HCID, you, you know, uh, you work for the city of LA. I don't know if you're appointed. We are elected officials, right? In our quasi governmental agency. So we are beholden to the people, the stakeholders who elected us in Lincoln Heights. So when we speak, we do not speak um, about, you know, in a biased way with an agenda about, you know, some grudge against Film LA. It's that, the community, uh, yeah, we're uh, we're uh, civil servants, so we're serving the people and then using our platform to get things answered. And the reason that the letter says city attorney is because we uh, choose to uh, dialogue with elected officials, not departments or appoint you know agencies. It's because it needs to be a top-down change in with the city's equity they're pushing. Uh, this falls right in with the uh, 
that new equity will. So, uh, you know, the demographics of a community, all that needs to be considered. And I see the city has motions in the works right now to uh, get some new reports on that, you know? So uh, yeah, the, just um, what we're talking about here is like, you know, not an attack on you. And I know you get slammed all the time by, you know. No, again, let, let, me, let me jump in Ms. Ms. Clinton, because I want to highlight that. Yeah, we work with the city attorney's office, particularly the neighborhood prosecutors, because when I see a picture like this, it, it's not just the production, it's also the host. It's those hosts, that property owner that's hosting the activity. That's why we work hand in hand with the neighborhood prosecutor, because we obviously have to have the collaboration with the appropriate city unit to go to that, that property owner and say, hey, what's going on? Why are you inviting this? Why are you allowing this? And then what we do on our end too, in addition, I should say, is track the number of permits. How often is this occurring? And then also, again, as Ms. Sanchez highlighted, if we're getting those complaints, because that's the justification that LAPD needs to begin shutting these things down. Yeah, it's like taxable income, you know, uh, yep. running, a, running a little business there. But uh, I don't know if the city actually has a cap on chronic filming. Um, but uh, when, uh, yeah, this is just, uh, you know, unfortunately with the storefront ten and then tenants upstairs, that's like a, a sticky situation, right? Um, and I'm sure you guys see it a lot in downtown, right? Oh, absolutely. There, there's constant, consistent filming in, in downtown too. Uh, but what I will highlight is there is collaboration that occurs. We don't know, and this is why I would need to go de in depth into the permit and also in depth into the location. We don't know what sort of coordination occurred with that production. Production is charged with conducting the appropriate outreach. And again, I, I hear you all when, when you're saying that uh, there's been negative interactions with some of those productions. And yes, that, that does happen. But I wanna stress that the reason why things work like a machine in downtown Los Angeles, particularly in the past 20 years, because now, as we all know, those are living, breathing neighborhoods, is the neighborhood associations or the building associations or the property managers conduct the outreach in tandem with the productions. And that outreach ranges from, as Ms. Sanchez highlighted, on occasion, yes, productions will put put families up in a hotel or they'll compensate them for the conveniences. That does occur. We don't know if that occurred here. Ms. Sanchez will is correct in that as a quasi-government entity, because because we're contracted by the city, we are not allowed to get involved in those conversations relative to comp to compensation. But what we can do is ensure that if it's a valid concern that that resident or whomever is being impacted, including the business, is in coordination and in communication with that production. So when I see a picture like this, my first question is gonna be, okay, well, who's hosting it? What's the location? Did they work with those businesses? And yes, are they allowing proper signage to, to go around or to cross the street, not go on the street, because then that would be a violation. I know it's like the city of LA, you know, we're part of this bubble. Uh, you know, we do work with the tenants unions, right? And it's like yeah. uh, HCID, you know, we have, uh, you know, our non-rent control apartment buildings, people are getting illegally evicted. M parents are like dying. People are made, being made homeless. Those substandard apartment buildings that are like hell on earth with roaches and everything that we fought for the tenants. People want to have a ghetto film scene. Suddenly they're filming like movies about the ghetto over there. And, and it's like our community sees this and they see our hillsides like flat top, uh, you know, people are renting out uh, our open space for filming all the time. Uh, made me think about ethics, right? And equity. So I went to like Hackless website to see like how they deal with filming. Say somebody wants to have some gangster scene at like, yeah, Jordan Downs or Ramona Gardens or whatever. You know, there's some red tape, right? It comes down to, uh, where you know they work with the the residents the re, the right. the resident residential advisory yeah. committee it's also like each of those housing rules. like you no know, obstructing yeah. people's doorways no you know being very respectful and it's like those rules should apply to our neighborhood too um, right and and what i'm saying and let me jump in if you're seeing it then again that that means that that could that 99 of the time that coordination did occur so someone's not waking up to all of a sudden 
they have a, a catering truck in front of them or these cables are being run in front of them. I, I want to I be sensitive. I want to be sensitive to Ms. Galomo too, because I know she's had her hand up too. And, and well, I know we've all been in this meeting for a while. First, actually. Um, I didn't know she was on the board. Sorry about that. We have public comment, Erica P. Erica. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, so first off, I really want to uh, say thank you for bringing this up to the table because um, like, as you met, I was also, I complained and uh, called and I also didn't receive any follow-up. So it's like, where do you go? Especially like where even the police don't help you, they, and I can't follow up with them. So I appreciate that I could follow up through here through my neighborhood council, that's something I appreciate, but also like, why am I having to do that in the first place? Why is there, where are the venues? So that's where my question lies in. Can you speak on what um, are the disciplinary actions you take on uh, film producers that violate their permits? And you discussed how you can't really do that. You can only, only LAPD can enforce it, but LAPD, was called by the film producers and when you know like other neighbors are calling uh, they didn't do anything but when the film producers called them they actually came at two in the morning and we're speaking with them i don't know what they said but i saw the cops talking with the film people and for that they did the cops did actually, did actually come by which is like okay what is up with that so i want to validate what Fernanda has said about like um there is does feel like a definitely like discrimination going on here like we can't go to the police they're not doing anything but you're saying they're the enforcers of people that break the permit but then the agency that actually gives out the permits doesn't have any disciplinary actions or process or workflow to uh deal with violators so you know if you could inform me and how would i receive follow-up what is another where do i go because honestly like i haven't seen that that yeah, follow-up there Absolutely, to totally understood. And again, apologies for uh, the lack the lack of follow up. I will investigate personally what the heck happened in the last uh, three days. Uh, again, get more information on the location, the address number one. Let me clarify too. What we do on our end is we are the facilitator of the permit. Uh, what we do is, depending on the request, because there's so many departments, as we all know here with the neighborhood council system uh, involved in the permit process, whether it's a uh, fire department or department of transportation, the list goes on and on. We work to coordinate all of those aspects as part of the permit and facilitate that and make sure that they're checking off what they need to check off that it works for them or it doesn't. LAPD film unit, and this, this is the part that gets um, uh, misconstrued. LAPD film unit is a specific unit that's charged with approving, enforcing, uh, and, and also working with us on making adjustments for all permits. Again, Sergeant Aguirre would have been here to, uh, today, but he's actually uh, at Dodger Stadium with their training because as we know, this, uh, the, um, uh, the season's gonna start up again. So he'll be more than happy to come back to, to a future meeting. He and I do meetings like this quite often. This, this is our responsibility. Uh, his unit, works hand in hand with the local divisions, whether it's Hollenbeck or you've got Northwest, Northeast in the area. Uh, if they're off hours, he and I have communicated on, on times like this, on a Sunday night or a, a Friday, uh, a Saturday morning or whatever may be the case. So from this point forward, I wanna make sure everyone has my contact information because my, my phone goes everywhere that, that I'm at. Uh, I'm, I'm consistently checking my, my emails because Filming does not stop. We're, we're very clear on that. So while we don't have the enforcement authority at FMLA, what we do have is the permit. We know exactly what's on the permit. We know exactly what they should be doing or not be doing. And once the information is brought to our attention, and let's use the example that, uh, that Ms. Sanchez provided with us, we would check if they had the sidewalk closure or if they had the, uh, uh, the language on the permit to ensure that equipment was allowed on the sidewalk. If it was not, and we clarify that it's a violation, we immediately get in contact with production because just like in any situation, we wanna give the opportunity to any agency to correct. Nine times out of 10, they do. When they don't, we either get a staffer out there or we get in contact with LAPD. When we get in contact with LAPD, it's because 
we're getting pushback from a production. And again, I'm, I, I want to be very candid here. We do get uh, pushback from some productions. They'll, they'll give us attitude like, oh, well, who do you think you are? Well, I got this permit. I spent this amount of money, so on and so forth. Uh, and when that happens, absolutely. We'll get the sergeant on the horn. He'll get in contact with the local patrol. They'll get out there. And this answers the question uh, that, that, er, that Miss I didn't get her last name, was Erica P. had, which is what are the violations? There are citations that are provided. Uh, they are misdemeanors. Uh, and who gets cited are the location teams. And what happens with those is those individuals are responsible, but what's also included in those violations is LAPD can shut them down. And as we all know, time is money. And literally in that business, they've rented equipment, they paid for staffers. So they don't wanna shut down, but we, we have shut down productions before. So there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of consequences here, which is again, why I started this conversation. While this group has not seen the, uh, the resources in effect, they, they are there. I believe I answered most of your questions. Again, I'm not sure what happened at, at two o'clock in the morning. Again, I would have to follow up to find out what was the result of LAPD getting out there, who they spoke with. Maybe it was the line producer, if a correction was made, if the police department uh, allowed them to continue whatever the violation was. But again, every, every permit is different. So I would need to see uh, what was going on, what happened, what went wrong and what was corrected if not anything if anything was corrected just to add um the police were there at 2 a.m and they saw the film crew there at 2 a.m because they were speaking to the film crews so and that was already a violation and past the permit time of 10 p.m again i would need to see the permit to, because permits do go beyond 10 p.m on occasion we had received confirmation from la film that night that the permit that it was, was a violation okay yeah. yeah um next public comment jobs All right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, let's have something very clear. FMLA is a nonprofit organization of uh, 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 501c4. So it's not a public agency of any sort. So actually FMLA has no power, power whatsoever to hold anyone accountable or the night permits or anything like that. That has to go, to go through a, um, a process from the city. Uh, and also uh, most of the, um, um, that Mr. Uh, Pina was saying is not 100% accurate nor true. I personally been dealing, uh, I have been dealing with, with uh, Phil Malay and all these, uh, uh, um, all these uh, production companies, corporations for many years. I have uh, reported, I have uh, uh, I submit uh, several reports through the, all these years. Uh, and not a single time Film LA has responded to any of them, nor uh, LAPD film unit, they're useless. What they do, they have an old car with a made up sign, uh, handmade sign or whatever, that says LAPD film unit and they park it most of the time on uh, red lanes, which are only for the use of uh, the fire department. Okay, so most of uh, what was being saying here is, 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 is baloney. The other one is um, also film LA cannot hold, hold, uh, hold accountable any production companies that is on violation of city or state law because it's not, he's not a, um, they're not an agency, uh, public agency or uh, city or, or on the state level. And many of the violations, okay, are state and federal levels which is of American with Disability Act and so many others. <clears throat> like for example, uh, from the pictures that Fernanda was showing to us, the whole sidewalk is obstructed. That cannot happen. According to the ADA uh, uh, regulations, you at least have to have five feet of free space for a person to, uh, uh, an ADA person can have free access at any time, not used by, by uh, AM from, from uh, AM to 5 PM, no, at any time, 24 seven, 365. So how a nonprofit organization will enforce any city or state law? That's a bunch of baloney. So if uh, another thing is like, Film LA must make their, um, 
their website or be more accessible to for people to actually find the, the proper permits. It's 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 incredible the difficulty to to get uh, uh, the the permits uh, copy of the permits. Now another law, city city and state law, city law. I'm sorry that requires the film uh, industry or any film uh, crew to have the permits available for the public view and or posted uh, on, a, on an area that the public can just have free access at any time. They don't do that. I have reported that to Film LA, to LAPD, to LAPD Film Unit, not a single thing. Uh, they have done anything about it. On the other hand, I've been harassed, I've been assaulted, by personnel from all this, from most of the uh, um, uh, film crews. I have video, I have pictures, I have witnesses. I reported it to the LAPD, I followed the whole thing, follow up, did the follow up. And the uh, city attorney told me, and on each and every time that there were not uh, uh, enough evidence of the attacks, of the assault, okay? Film LA has never ever done nothing about it. So don't expect FMLA to do anything. Hopefully uh, we are on a different times and they're gonna start doing their job or trying to, but so far, uh-uh, you should sue them. If you have all the all the, uh, all the, the, the ways to do it, sue them because that's the only way they're gonna start uh, uh, addressing those, all these health and, and safety and welfare issues that affect most of the, 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 our pure communities. These guys came to our communities thinking that they own the city, they own our communities, they're wrong. You don't believe me, go to Frogtown and um, Residents Opposing Gentrification on Facebook. There is all the videos and pictures from what, I'm, what I just stated, thank you. Thank you, Jabs. Um, we're gonna move on to Melanie. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, I, yeah, I guess I just wanna say, yeah, it's difficult voicing these um, like realities that the community is going through. Um, you know, we're a community that is commonly exploited and commonly being told that what we're saying is happening isn't happening. Um, so, you know, in a situation of what happened on Friday, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's a, a little difficult, you know, when you're supposed to be able to go home at 10 and then you can't go home until two and then you have a community that's like a very low income working class community um, that are up early and working late. Um, it, there's so many more implications with not being able to get into your home um, than maybe in a upper class or middle upper class community and not to compare, but it, it is just the truth. And um, also with, with the calling of the cops on the community who are having to experience the abuse, I, I, I just, I God, I pray that there is some accountability on the part of the host and part of the production. And I don't know what recourse Film LA has, but maybe if there's something that can be written into the permit process, those permits can be given to the residents who are gonna be directly affected so that they themselves bilingual, trilingual, permits are, are given to them so they can keep track of what's being violated in real time and have some recourse themselves, um, as well as making sure that if there is a, a host or somebody who is getting financial, um, getting money for renting out their space, that the people who are directly affected by that, who are not getting you know financially boosted from that, um, at the very least are not going to be um, negatively impacted by it. It's one thing to not pay a community, it's another thing to negatively impact them financially because of uh, you know the inconveniences and abuse that they're put through. Um, that's it, thanks so much. Thank you, Melanie. We're gonna move on to Richard Ortiz. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, there was an incident a couple, I'm not sure if it was a year ago or some, or some time ago. They were directing us to park at a location up the street, Bank of America, which one of the workers, there was a, a sign specifically like put right there to park there, but he made us park on the, on the side with the meters. So everyone who parked there got a ticket. We had to pick it, pay it out of our pockets and wait like three months for, for a reimbursement. Aside from that, I'd like to know specifically for some of the community members who are scared, like, like, like we stated, they're bilingual, they don't know, or they don't even speak English, you know? 
what's the best strategy to record the incidents? Uh, times, dates, who was there, get names, if that's even possible for us. Uh, but that's it. Richard. And our last comment, Vincent. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. so I think, you know, one of the recommendations being part of the, the committee is that I think we need to make our own rules, regulations on when LA film comes. I've worked on a lot of film projects where, yes, the West side always gets paid. And I'll say it, white people are not gonna sit there and allow the abuse that happens in our brown and black communities. And movie industry understands that they take advantage. Our whole, our whole community is a prop to them. The inconvenience that they bring when their trucks come here, even though you get the consent of the city, does not mean you get the consent of the community. And if you believe that, you've practiced colonialism to come in and step over the people. The decent thing to do would be to knock, not have to come to a neighborhood council or anywhere, do what you guys do on the West side and knock on their doors and say, here's the film, you're directly impacted, okay? You may lose parking. We're trying to fix the situation on parking and maybe get a shuttle ride to you. And then we're gonna compensate you. When that doesn't happen, to me, it's blatant racism. I'm gonna call it what it is. It's an abuse of our, of our, ass, our public asset and it's wrong. And I think that LA Film has a horrible history with that. Well, our, our, and I'm going to suggest another thing that we start making reports on LA Film has a, on their website. They do have a, an area where we can file, but not only file with them, start to file with LAPD. These are clear violations of what they're doing. And far too often, they violate state, city, and county, and even the permit right by overextending themselves there by having a change of uh, director's idea where they have now shooting firearms or they overgo the hours. And these crazy hours that they put in our community, remember you're, you're in a residential area. I think I heard someone say this, that, that our people work. They work multiple jobs, multiple hours. And the only time that they're ever at peace to get rest is when you decide to come at two, three in the morning and film. And that's a huge inconvenience. That, that, I mean, that, that's something that you knock on the door and say, we're sorry, let us get you a hotel. I mean, that, that's having courtesy and common respect for the people of our neighborhood. And I don't see that with the, the uh, Film LA or any of the, of the industries from Paramount to Sony or anybody that comes films in brown and black communities. So I'm gonna suggest, and if somebody wants to help write it, that we write our own document that should be given to them that compensation should be given to them, that if parking's going to be affected, then parking should be provided. If the noise is going to be so outrageous that even in a hotel should be uh, provided for them if they, if they choose to want to go to it. But compensation must be given to them. That's my two cents. Thank you, Vincent. Are there any more board member or public comments? Please raise your hand or press star nine to do so. I see none. Oh, Sarah. Ah, uh, hey, uh, Vince. Uh, or anybody that knows. Uh, yeah. So, AFFH. Uh, the new uh, how uh, the new equity thing. Um, uh -huh. Civil rights. AFFH, right? Uh, yeah. All public agencies now. AFFH is it's, it spans large swaths of our municipality on multiple levels. It's not just about housing. It's about accessibility, language justice, all that stuff, um, vulnerable communities. Uh, so um, yeah, all public agencies, let's see, um, sorry, civil rights program. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, anything that's funded by federal money or government money or any public agency must comply. Uh, oh, God. 
the obligation of, to AFFH for public agencies applies to all housing and community development programs and activities. Programs and activities should be considered expansively and not in a manner to limit affirmatively furthering fair housing. For example, most state agencies are involved in some combination of planning slash financial investment, regulatory function, technical assistance, outreach, and education. All these broad categories should be considered programs and activities. This expansive application of programs and activities also applies to local governments, capital improvement plans, code enforcement, other regulatory function, housing assistance programs, planning and zoning documents should all furtherly affirm fair housing. Now, when you read this whole thing, it's pretty crazy just how expansive it is. Um, includes taking proactive and meaningful actions that have a significant impact on in integrating living patterns and socioeconomic concentrations well beyond combating discrimination or mitigating disparities. Meaningful actions must be taken in concert with each other and address all of the following. Uh, anyway, it's, it's all about like civil rights, uh, just all that stuff. Um, and the city adopted this and they're trying to apply it to city planning and stuff, but the filming thing is an initiative of the mayor. It's a thing that's funded or, you know, partially, you know, uh, program uh, champion by the city and facilitated by it. So uh, I would assume Film LA has to comply with this, right, Vince? And it affects housing too. AFFH. Do you know? Yes, you you need to me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, co-ops, right? Oh, okay. there's, there's all of these things that the city. No, it's a federal. It's a federal thing. Um. All right. Should we move this to a vote? Anyway, whatever. But yeah. So like, so the equity stuff. You know, cities like you know having to uh you know come correct on a lot of things has been pressured a little. Uh. And uh, this is kind of one of them that needs to address equity, all the racism and stuff. Let's go for a vote, I guess, Bernie, right? You have your I letter, right? Mm -hmm. I present the motion to approve the letter to City Attorney FMLA CD14 LHDHCID regarding chronic filming affecting RSO tenants. Um, do I have a second? Richard seconds. Thank you, Richard. We're now going to move this to a vote. Sarah Clendenny? Yes. Benny Madera? Yes. You know, it, it's all advisory anyway. It's not like you fuck it up. <laughs> Christopher Adams? Yes. <laughs> oh, it's on sure. Vincent Montalvo? Yes. <sighs> Melanie? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Richard Ortiz? Yeah. on. And Fernanda Sanchez, yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Woo. All right. Thank you, Fernanda. That item. All right. So next we're going to move on to the big juicy item. And I'm going to try to give you guys a scoop real quick. But it's something that's important and, it, and there's some secrets that haven't been revealed. All right. Discussion of possible action on community impact statement regarding council file 17 1038. Flat top, 1050 Montecito Drive, Kiss FM, Radio Tower, Los Angeles Police Department, UHF Voice Radio System, Hollenbeck Police Department, Lease or Property Purchase, Studio uh, Stalson. Um, let me find the motion here. So this is the uh, antenna property, the radio tower up at Flat Top. Uh, since 1948, in 1948, it was bought by this other radio station that used to be down at, on Spring Street at the arcade building. And so, uh, yeah, Kiss, uh, I forget what it was called back then, but then in 1961, it was sold to the Four Square Church. So that was far after Amy Semple McPherson died, committed suicide or whatever. Um, she never went there. Uh, so this radio tower property, 
with the whole flat top park and you know uh, the acquisition of that land, that was the four square church liquidating their assets um, that they had bought owned since 1961. And they wanted to build 40 houses on the hillside. Montecito Heights, Roy Payan, uh, they uh, bought it and then saved that land and it was uh, put in a public private partnership with Northeast Trees uh, to maintain it, right? So the crown jewel of that whole so-called flat top park was supposed to be that radio tower property, right? Um, 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 can you just, uh, okay, just get all the way back to the end of the couch then, sweetie? Right, right. In 2017, uh, yeah, all the way. In 2017, uh, the property was put up for sale and it sold to a private party, a person from Venice. I'm not gonna name their name. And uh, it was sold for 1.6 million. Uh, meanwhile, uh, so this person got the property, they're throwing events, but large scale events, clogging up Montecito Drive, but not just yoga, but like concerts, right? But on that site, there are radio towers. And uh, guess who realized they had their radio towers there after that property sold for 1.6 million? Hollenbeck Police Department. So they've got a couple radio towers there. Uh, there was a motion uh, filed, a couple of motions, and this is what the community impact statement's about. Uh, the city went into negotiate. So, so when, so the city realized they had their uh, transmitter there for the police department, right? Uh, but they for, they didn't realize that they had like a free fifty year lease with the church before, and then it sold. So the new owner hit up the city and said, hey, I want rent for these radio towers. City's been in negotiations. So they've been writing a check to the owner of the property for $97,000 a year to rent, you know, where these radio towers stick out. Just the radio towers. The guy has like full reign of the property, right? Um, has been throwing parties. Somebody climbed a radio tower, the lights went out. Um, anyway, it's a, a safety risk. So the city, city put out this motion that's going to expire, expire in uh, a couple of days, like five days. It's uh, proposing that the city um, buy the prop, uh, acquire the property, right? I don't know if it's eminent domain or what, buy it. Basically, the city, should, you know, they could have bought it for one point six million. Now they're paying for paying ninety seven thousand dollars a year, uh, it's giving this guy free, you know, paying his mortgage. Um, so uh, we are asking that uh, the city uh, acquire this for um, public park property for, uh, yeah, uh, eminent domain for uh, the good of the public. And then, um, but also more importantly, there was a report from the city attorney or general services division. They try, tried to find a site that they re could relocate the towers to because they don't want to pay a hundred thousand, but they they came to the conclusion that um, that is the only site that is uh, that performs the function because it uh, flat top or that it transmits straight to Hollande. Boom, you know, there's it would cost millions and millions of dollars for them to relocate it. So the city has to choose whether they want to. Um, eminent domain's property or purchaser or whatever, or get into litigation with the owner or just keep uh, hemorrhaging taxpayer money uh, for no reason. So uh, yeah, since this person's hosting private parties uh, at this site that's not zoned for that with no uh, conditional use permit or anything. And then people uh, actually can climb the radio towers and there's no security. Uh, it, it puts everybody's lives at risk because uh, somebody could just shut down the whole communication system for the police department or whatever. And that's uh, pretty messed up. So the motion might, so I wrote a letter just saying what I said. And uh, I have some of the documents attached. Um, Cedillo, I guess, has uh, five days to either bring this to council or not. Um, and uh, a Royal Seco Neighborhood Council wrote a community impact statement. Um, and it would be them and us. And uh, apparently uh, I emailed CD1 about this. And I said, hey, uh, yeah, Cedillo and um, Jose, like, uh, can you give me an update on this? Or what's up? It's about to expire. 
and then uh, apparently they've been having meetings all the time with uh, Montecito Heights. Um, and then we asked for a meeting, Diego did, and then they told us no. So, uh, or they didn't have the time. Um, but the funny thing is that that property, a uh, lot, half of it is in Lincoln Heights. Uh, so uh, we just want to crank up the heat, get something going here. And uh, everybody knows that property and we uh, need to need it for uh, the people. And that's uh, my position. So uh, yeah, any uh, comments, board member? Comments, dialogue? I just have a quick comment. Um, I can't recall if it was the summer of 2019 or summer of 2020 um, that this little yoga company set up on Radio Tower and they were charging for little yoga sessions on public space and they had this entire setup. It's not public. Um, it's private property. Oh, yeah. right. They were doing it without like any actual permits or anything. The like owner's that. been running it. So if you go on like Google Maps, it's called like Station LA. So he has like a couple LLCs registered there. Mm. Uh, this person knows to do or you know, there's some more connection. I can't stop going to it. But uh, so they've been uh, renting it to different, uh, not nonprofits, but different uh, corporations for uh, pop-up events and stuff like that during COVID. Uh, one of the things they did was they built all these like structures on the site. They were running like a sort of spa there, large scale, but you know, like uh, whatever it's in like uh, West Side magazines, like, you know, they discover the East Side, you know, and then you realize you're looking at like Lincoln Heights from above, you know? So uh, about like, 40 people from like Lincoln Heights called, reported them to LEDBS. Um, they were cited. I think they applied for not a conditional use permit, but something. But they uh, basically Montecito Heights has been kind of up their butt because uh, they've been trying to acquire that property for a long time for the park. Um, but also, uh, yeah, the person's been um, having like just huge uh, like concerts, concerts where all the cars are basically parked all the way, blocking the whole Montecito Drive. And uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, it's that, it was an inside sale, uh, basically uh, somebody associated politically uh, got in and swooped it up. And uh, it's not being used, uh, it's being used against the way that it's zoned, right? Um, the city's been kind of like, taking its time on this, but uh, the fact that we have LAPD transmitters there, or not we, but they are there. Uh, the, yeah, the digger, I, the deeper I dug, I saw that, you know, the city's paying $100,000 a year to rent them. And I, you know, I think that that is um, wrong to waste taxpayer money uh, because of they were um, slow and forgot that they had them there or something and they could have bought them. So uh, that's it. And uh, city needs a property because the radio towers are there. Can't move them, city property, take it. All right, I motion to approve the community impact statement regarding council file 17-1038-1050 Montecito Drive and the radio tower. Do I have a second? Richard seconds. Woo. Richard seconds. If anyone from the public has any comments, please raise your hand or press star nine to do so. I don't see any, any board member comments, please raise your hand. I don't see any, so I'll go ahead and take it for a vote. Sarah? Si. Yes. Benny Madera? Yes. Christopher Adams? Yes. Melanie Bolomo? Yes. Nancy Soto? Yes. Richard Ortiz? Simon. And Vincent Montalvo? Yeah. Vincent Montalvo? Yes. Yeah. So. It's I was thinking, I was thinking, can you guys hear me? Maybe, you know, yeah. 
Okay, I vote yes. The next. Thank you. It's unanimous, motion carries. Motion carries. Woo, all right, so, oh, we have another item. Seven, future agenda. Just real quick. Oh my God. Board, just off the top of your heads, I got a pen and a paper, any future agenda items, real quick. No? Nobody has any future agenda items for the Planning and Land Use Committee? I do not see any hands up, but for future reference, if they do have something they want to add to the item, they can just email you or myself. Well, is that for Brown? You know, we're, we're supposed to talk out in front of the people. Okay. So um, I have one. Uh, we need to follow up on the um, Carlos Rittner, 8,500 square foot um, giant thing at uh, Flat Top, right? It was approved by the city last year. And uh, yeah, there's just, uh, whatever. ADUs, I wanna tap into that on maybe the next month. So uh, yeah, cool. And then housing is key, sign up. And I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, yeah, so we have one more item, public comment again. And do we have any public comments just for the wrap? Final moment? No? All right, so uh, motion to adjourn, right? Shit, what happened? Um, I'll there... go ahead and motion to adjourn. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. I'll second the motion. Aye. I really very <laughs> tough drop. Hi guys for hanging in there. See you tomorrow. Uh bye see guys. You. I'm gonna talk about that or you know short meeting. Thank you guys. Nice. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Hey, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>